Right, so this evening is, and this is a topic which came up when I was digging around for things that we could talk about, it is all about sound recognition. And can we do a bit of what I call machine intelligence, which is a branch of artificial intelligence. Many of you have probably heard about machine learning and deep learning. This is just another branch of that. Machine learning is just old school mathematics like calculus, algebra, statistics, probability. It's That's all machine learning really is, just a lot of it and done quickly. And machine intelligence is a variant of that, which is all the machine learning stuff plus anything else to get the job done. So by hook or by crook. So from a commercial perspective, where you're trying to sort of get a job done, whatever it may be, you might chuck something else that's got nothing to do with AI or machine learning, but hey, it, it gets a result. And that's very much the, the, the area of interest that I have. So uh, let's have a look to start with. There's a, there's a few little bits just to wrap our heads around. Not nothing too much. So up on your screen here is a typical sound wave that you might might see. And what we want to try and do and have a look at before 8.30 is what can we do to try and recognize a particular sound pattern? And not just recognize it, do something useful with it. So just going to dig into this just for a second. So sound is just waves, whether, whether it's but light is just waves as well. Uh, sound that you can hear me right now is in the audio range of, I think, 20 hertz up to 20 kilohertz. Ultrasonics that you hear a little bit about um, is 400 kilohertz, the no, 40 kilohertz, I think, uh, a little bit higher above the human range. So just what I want to show you here is just to set the scene a little bit for, well, what is it we're trying to do when we look at sound? So on the right hand side, uh, D and E are just a couple of typical waves that you might get to see. And on the right are the waves that if you were to stick them together, give you those waveforms D and E, whether we're just adding A and B or A and C. And C is the same as B, it's just out of phase. So that's a very simplified example of what is sound. It's made up of waves, what are the waves? Here they are. When we're talking about sort of sound, we've got many more of these frequencies all dropping in and out of phase with each other. So it's it's quite a moving playing field that we're going to try and make some sense of. And just here, that's the time domain. We can also look at things in what we call the frequency domain. So here we've got, in this example, we've got two frequencies, 100 hertz and 200 hertz. Just Stephen, our example. excuse me, please. Yep. Um, we can't see anything else. We oh, no, no, no. See, this exactly. is why people This is why people need to stop me. <laughs> right, hang on a second, everybody. Right, we will backtrack. Right, it's up on my screen. You want to see... Uh, hang on a second, everybody. Dear, I did. Everyone's just listen to me bang on there, and I'm looking at a lovely screen here, and and you're not. Is that any better? Yes or no? That's a lot better, thank you. There you go. You see, now you feel you're part of the story, don't you? <laughs> right. Yeah, let's, sure. Let me just back up one slide luckily luckily everybody it's a shame you didn't get to see these lovely pictures right let me just back up a slight couple of slides right okay so um let me just recap within two seconds things you didn't see that i saw and i was enjoying it 
So let me just recap very quickly. This is why I need the interruptions, as you see. Everyone's just thinking, does he know? So let me just recap very quickly. The Whirlwind Tour is everything we've got here is available to download. Um, there is the website link to this presentation and the software and the Excel we're going to have a look at, spreadsheet we're going to have a little look at. This will be up a little shortly. We will have a little break halfway through. I tried this last time and it was sort of reasonably well received. So we'll have just a two minute break, which is just enough time. So saying, talking to myself with the slides earlier, um, just to grab a plate of biscuits and recharge the brain cells. Right, okay, we're doing sounds. Right, you missed this picture. This is what sound might look like. And what we want to try and do is find a way with a Raspberry Pi Pico and some micro Python code is can we find some way to quantify sound to break it down and try and make some sense of it that's the name of the game of this evening right back to this slide that was very quick so when I was enjoying this slide without you <laughs> um on the right just some a couple of examples of what waves might look like and they're made up of different waves, whether it be 100 or 200, they might be in phase or out of phase like B and C, and depending on the phase also affects the graph uh, that you get out of it, D and E. But as I was saying, with sound, of course, this is changing all the time. So it's quite a complicated picture we're going to try and make some sense of. And just when uh, Deborah just interrupted me to say, can't see anything, you might also be able to represent those waves in what we call the frequency domain. Now, just the key takeaway from this is when you look at the frequency domain, it's not looking at whether signals are in or out of phase. So B and C would look exactly the same in the frequency domain. You'd have to start looking at phase. So things are getting a little bit more complicated. But what we're going to try and do is see if we can do something with this uh, this evening. Right, okay, we're all back on track and you can all still see the slides, I hope. So <clears throat> these are just my key points to share if you're looking at something in the time domain and in the frequency domain. And don't forget, we're trying to do this on a Raspberry Pi Pico. So we're not with a dual M0 plus ARM core going to be able to do something you know as as snazzy as as google where you know you can just tell it where you want to go and it'll give you some directions that's not what you're going to be able to do with a small microcontroller but there is a lot of stuff you still can do and that's what we're going to have a look at but what i will say if you notice on the right hand side a couple of things that i just pull out so i won't read the slide to you if you're doing something in what's called the frequency domain, you've got to have two samples per every frequency that you want to measure. So if you're going up to the top end of audio, which would be, say, 20 kilohertz, you're going to have to have a sample rate of at least 40 kilohertz. So you've got those two samples so you can work out what the frequency component is going to be. And if you're looking at something like a Raspberry Pi Pico, you haven't got a lot of memory to do it in. You've got SRAM of 256 kilobytes. And as you can see here, just for, to grab a waveform and do some frequency analysis, you're going to have to have 160 kilobytes. So we're using a lot of the memory. And in fact, don't forget that SRAM is roaded, I think, to about 190 kilobytes once you've got MicroPython installed on it. So what can we do about it is the question. So what we're going to have a look at is offloading a lot of the audio analysis, the frequency stuff of it, off the micro, uh, the Pico, do it a slightly different way. And then we're going to have a go at putting those results into the micro to do a little bit of number crunching. Um, let me show you how we're going to do that. So let's say we, on the left, we've got our audio signal and I, I've got my oscilloscope hooked up. So we'll have a look at that in just a second. 
And what I'm going to do on the Pico, there are three um, ADC inputs. Um, so which are called zero to one, two, and three. And so what we're going to do with the audio, we're going to pass them through two filters. Now, the first filter is going to take out all the low frequencies. So we just look at the high frequency parts of the audio file or sound. We've got a low pass filter, LPF, which is just going to look at the low frequency component. And then in the middle, you can see we've got the reference, which is just the standard audio that as we've got. So we've got something that we can measure against. And uh, for those of us of a certain age, who remember ghetto blasters back in the 80s. You had those little dials that went all up and down. They were just filters. So this stuff's been around a long, long time. So that's the general picture of what we want to try and create. So let's have a bit of a dig through and see if we can work out how can we make this work. So the first port of call is a amplifier for the audio. Um, I've got this one on a board, which we'll have a look at in just a second. We'll swap the camera so you can see it. And this one works quite well. Um, I think it's about four pounds. You can buy them in good volume from DigiKey at the moment and Farnell and Mauser. Uh, it's a small electric, electric microphone. I'll just swap the cameras in a second. And that is AR and gain, because this is an automatic gain control. That's what AGC stands for. So if you talk in a whisper, it will try and amplify the sound. And if you talk loudly, then it will try and dial it back. Uh, there is also what's called AR, which I think is for um, attack and R is something else. <laughs> I found that there are some issues with how you set this. On these two on the left is AR and this gain. So you do have to have a bit of a play because you will get uh, when you're Got a sound you'll slowly sort of increase and then you get like a decay at the end where the sound suddenly gets smaller now if you've got a lot of high freaks in the sound at the end then it'll start to taper off some of the important information that you're trying to analyze so the moral of the story is that when there are control pins to things like an amplifier you might have to have a little bit of a play with it in order to get the best effect for what you might be trying to do. So we'll swap to the screen and just unscreen just a moment. So there's a couple of things I want to show you. So that would give us the audio, would give us the reference for our amplifier, which was there. That. That's the middle one. Well, we'll now have a look into the high pass and the low pass on how do we do that? Because remember, there's hardly any memory to do this in the Pico. So we're going to offload it from the Pico, do it externally, and just put that filtered result into the Pico. And this is a, how you can do it. So one of my favorite filters um, when I had to do my degree way back when was something called a Chevy Chev filter. If you look in some books, there are so many different types of filters. Uh, there's a simple RC one, which you often see, resistor and a capacitor. So, but more advanced ones use, as we have here, inductors and capacitors. And that's what we just gave a, a little bit of a look on. How do you put those together to get the right frequencies for an audio filter? What I like about the Chevy Chev filter is it has, as you can see, just in the graph just below there, hopefully you can all still see it, is it's got a very, what we call a very sharp roll off, which means that I can have two filters. I've got one in the green, which is my low pass filter, and I've got one on my right in yellow, which is my high pass filter, yellow, orange. And in order to work out what these values might be, we actually just use what's called a lookup table. So someone's done the hard work for us. So none of this is guesswork. So, and I'll show you exactly how you can do that. Excuse me, please. Yeah. Um, you say on the right is a high pass filter. 
Yeah. They both say low pass filter. Uh, it does. Good spot. I'm glad you're awake. That's because I copied it and didn't do the change. Yes. Okay. Low should say hi. Thank you. I will correct that later. <laughs> There you go. I was writing this this morning and, and doing some of the code. Yeah, sorry. Good spots. That's to make sure everybody is fully on board and awake. Yes, it should say a hi. So just so if you're curious, so just to work out, well, which one is it? If you look on the left with C2, C3 and C4, capacitors, as, they're, as you apply a higher and higher frequency, their impedance gets smaller and smaller. So as high frequencies go through the green one with those C2, C3, and C4, it'll start to basically attenuate the signal. And inductors do the opposite. So with inductors, L1 and L2, as the frequency will increase, so will their impedance. So inductors, they are their impedance is proportional to the frequency, and for capacitors, they're inverse. So on the right, good catch on the typo. If you look at it, then low frequencies, the capacitors uh, C5, 6, and 7 will start to have a high impedance. And as we get to higher frequencies, then the capacitors and pinches will start to drop. So you'll start to get pass through. So, yes, uh, I should have spotted that, shouldn't I? But there we go. So, um, top tip. So, this is a great book, and they have actually written it in there. So, uh, I, I don't have any shares in this, but this book here, if you're looking for a book on filter design, and I've got a couple of pages from it in just a second, this has got loads in there. Um, that's the ISBN number. Um, I checked earlier, um, just shy of £40 of Amazon. This one I recommend if you're looking to do some work with any sort of filtering. So how on earth are we going to work out the values for a filter? Well, I've got it written correctly there, look. <clears throat> so it all starts with what we call a lookup table. So none of these values are guess work. And in a moment, we'll have a look at an Excel spreadsheet on how you can tweak it. But depending on what sort of roll off you want, which is how sharp that gradient is from the things that you don't want to what you do want, called a stop band or a pass band, will determine which the end, which is the pole, uh, with how many you want. So in what we've done here, I've gone for five poles filter. And the values they give here are for a, always a specific frequency of uh, 1 over 2 pi. And what we'll look at in just a second is once you know what frequency you want, you just have to scale the components. And it's as easy as that. So let me share with you how on earth that looks. So hopefully if I... Uh, one second. Right. What I can't see is my unshare screen. Hang on a second. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, I haven't stopped here. Right. <clears throat> right. So if I share this screen instead, new share. Right, is that sharing a spreadsheet for you all? Oh, hang on. No. No, no, it will. We've got the previous. Oh, uh, yes, it's just come yeah, on there. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. If you could go back to your previous slide. Yeah. Isn't on those two pages the same image? Yeah. Sorry, I'll put the wrong slide in there. Right. Okay. It was a long day. <laughs> <laughs> you it did was... spit the technical communication oh. to spot the de deliberate errors, wouldn't you? Oh, see, spot, right? the, spot the deliberate errors. Yeah. Okay. You'll have to forgive me. Right. I tell you, I tell you don't worry. Don't worry. I won't go back to the slide because you'll all see it. 
Right. OK, let me show you here. So on these filters, if you remember the slide before, which I did have correct, because I modeled the filters, we had the resist the capacitors and the resistors all swapped around. So what I've done is I've copied in here in the first table what they say, and that's the, the frequency of uh, one over two pi. It's always two pi radians. These things are never done in Hertz. It's always radians. If you want to do it in Hertz, you've got to do some scaling. Well, basically, it's one divided by two pi is, in this case, 0.16 Hertz. So I've copied the tables in here for the high pass and the low pass. I then just select what frequency I want, and then it, it will scale. And that's all it does. You just have to, it just automatically then just scale all the frequencies. So the way this works, uh, hopefully if I just pick one, this one here, there you go. You can see it's, this is equal to the value it was times the ratio of, say I want 800 Hertz for my low pass filter divided by 0 0.1, 0 0.16. So it's just a scaling, dead easy. So they do the work for you. But of course you end up with values that you can't really use very well. So you then need to scale the scaling. But in order to do the scaling without ending up um, changing the frequencies, the capacitors will scale up whilst the inductors will scale down. And so you just then need to play around with it until you find some values which you can buy. And in this case here, I've done it on the bottom row and I've built this so I know at least I've got one thing right this evening. Is uh, so this is it in red. So you can actually download this and have a play with it. Um, but what you'll see is in red, if you fiddle the ones in red, you can then change the frequencies. So for example, that's saying um 800, if I make that 1800, if that but I can, but of course my keyboard's not working, so I, I won't let that change. There we go. So there you go. So let's see, it changes all the numbers. So you can actually just have a bit of a play with that and you'll see how you can design the audio filter for the frequencies. So what I've done here, I've created one filter that has all the low frequencies up to 800 Hertz. And then my other one is anything above, um, it's roughly about 2100 um, Hertz. And that's the filter I had and that's what I've got on the board. Right, I hope everyone's still with me on that. Um, yeah, but ha hang on a second. Um, you went up to 1800 and then you went back to 800. Yeah. Uh, be before you made any changes at all, the bottom right figure on that portion of the table, RI over R, was 99. But now it's 222. Right. Yeah, it's probably the way my computer's working. Uh, it it should oh hang on a sec. it's weird because my keyboard and my laptop don't seem to be synced there you go so okay. yeah yeah you have to press return <laughs> I'll go back to sleep in this corner now okay no no you. no please ch ch challenge me all the way <laughs> I, I'm I'm all for the queries and are you sure <clears throat> um, yes most of what I have here does get tested. <laughs> And of course, I've done the same for the other filter as well. Now, of course, you could, if you wanted uh, an even sharper roll off, then you choose you know, a filter with even more inductors and even more capacitors. So it's all about money and how much real estate you've got on your board. And these are analog filters. Of course, you can do with op amps. It's a little bit more complicated. I thought I'd just try and keep it simple for us. Right, so that's about, you can download that. That's actually on the download. You're very welcome to grab that. And I will then hopefully swap back to a different screen. And I think if I scroll back to a page which does not seem to be there. Oh, there it is. Right, if I new share that one, I think the next slide righty yeah so the next slide will actually be um 
Uh, time for a break. All right, I tell you what, before we do that, everybody, what I'll do is I'm just going to swap the camera so you can actually see the electronics and how it works, and then we will have a two minute break. Well, so at least I try and make sure I haven't got any more errors in my show time. So let me just swap to this here. Uh, I know this one here, share. There we go. Right. You, uh, hopefully you can all see that. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Good. Brilliant. I'm pleased. <laughs> Right, so this is this is the actual electronic setup that that we've got there, and all this. Um, slightly out of focus there, isn't it? But uh, we'll have to live with uh, desk cam. So what I've got, so this here on the, I use a pen. So this is our our Pico on the site here. We, we haven't looked at what's in there yet. We'll do that after we've had a two minute break. So I've got plumbed into this. This is my field. So this is the Max M chip. You can, you can just get it on a small board. Yeah, still there. Let's make sure I've lost the. Uh, the audio or anything and uh, and then these are my filters here so although there's only three filters uh three inductors for the high pass i've actually got um four because i've got two um in i think they're in series so i've got a higher in inductance so and you can see here so this is the output directly from the amplifier that's our reference so you can see we've got lots and lots of sound coming out there. And if we just pop it on, I think this is the low pass filter here. So these are all the low frequencies, like A, N. If we do high frequencies like an S, hopefully it should not respond because it should be cutting out. But S is usually up in about the five kilohertz region. So uh, is hardly responding. And hopefully if we stick it on here, this is the high pass filter. So an mm, which is a low sound, it's not really responding, but a high things like S, which is it picks it up. <clears throat> so you could, of course, have a whole load more of these if you were trying to sort of look at frequency bands. You could certainly put a load of them together. For the stuff we're looking at, I've only just put two on. And of course, on a Raspberry Pi Pico, you've only got three uh, pins to start, three ADC inputs you can play with. If you wanted to do more, then maybe you'd have to add either a, uh, a analog multiplexer, which is just like a selector switch, or maybe a second Raspberry Pi Pico and have some audio going into that and then try and connect the digital side of the two Picos together. So there's ways around all these things. So that's the whirlwind tour of the electronics. Let me just go back to here, which is that one, which is that one, and say, right, two minute break, grab a plate of biscuits, and a, a glass of water or a glass of milk up on the pages is the web link there so if you want to download any, any of this they can uh, i will make those corrections that were spotted before anyone does if you give me a half hour afterwards and i will allow you to recharge for a moment
Right. Okay. Hopefully, brains unfrazzled, and uh, everyone's still still with me. So, uh, hopefully, that will put us back in the uh, in the saddle. Just recharge our brains for a sec, a, a brain break, if you like. So, just before the break, there we were having a bit of a dig into. Um, as I've just got up here on the screen, which hopefully is sharing. Tom tells me if it's not. I, um, uh, audio and frequency domain, but at the right the beginning, the audio amplifier circuit, which is the 9815, uh, it is available in good volume at the moment. We did mention there were a couple of pins, gain and AR, you need to have a play with because particularly the AR one, um, because it will attenuate the, like, like, like an echo end of a word, it just tapers it, as it to get quiet to the automatic gain control. That does affect audio quality, I've discovered. And of course, we had a look at Chevy Chev filters. The reason I always choose Chevy Chev is because it's got a really nice sharp roll off and it's very easy to design. So what we'll now dig into, hopefully, is um, the, the Pico side of it. So how does that work? It says that it's mouse not playing. There we go. So uh, this is the Pico on here. So this little table here. So I've grabbed a couple of um, lines of code here at the top for our filters. So you can see on the right hand side, I might be able to uh, grab a laser pointer. Hopefully, there we go. You can see that hopefully on the screen. So yeah, so we're going to plumb into ADC zero, uh, ADC one, and ADC two. So that's all we, we're going to plumb into. All these other pins are what I proposed in a previous talk that we used. Um, so you've got an I2C and SPI parallel buses, resets, diagnostics. So apart from the ADC pins, um, it's almost a free for You can do almost anything-ish with the other ones, but not, not quite, but ish. So uh, what we're going to do is... I've got a micro Python program which is running on this setup here. So I'm going to change screens for us. So if I was to share a new screen, which was funny, and share. Right. Okay. That's saying something we don't want it to say. There we go. Right, so uh, if anyone's wondering what is Sony, Sony is um, it's the Raspberry Pi recommended, uh, well, the one they advocate at any rate, um, MicroPython uh, IDE, Integrated Development Environment. It's completely free. We just skip back to, I think, the one of the maybe the first talk we did on this season three. Um, all the links are there for downloading and installing Sony. If you've got Raspberry Pi, like the three or four, or one of the only ones, you'll probably find Sony is pre-installed. MicroPython is just a cut down version of Python 3. And they've just taken things out, like, like graphics have been taken out, you know, and audio have been taken out, and camera stuff's been taken out, because it wouldn't fit and you don't use it in a micro uh, controller. So if you can program in, Python, you can definitely program micro Python. Absolutely. So what we'll do, we'll have a dig through this little program and I'll show you how I've done some of the machine intelligence stuff. So uh, this is where I define the pins. So these are my, I had that this on the previous slide here. So you can see, hopefully you can see, so I'm safe, it's not there. Uh, my high free pass filter, my reference and my low pass filter. So I'm actually gonna just pass the, filtered audio signals into the micro and then do some number crunching. So let's have a little look through how, how do we do that. So the first thing which I'm going to do for this to work is I want to have a look at what's a background threshold level. So 
rather than just sitting there doing number crunching all the time, I want to find out to start with, well, at what point does the microcontroller need to be listening? So to do that, all I'm going to do is just set a threshold level by listening. And then I'm going to calculate, I was playing with this this afternoon, um, what I found the easiest way to find the threshold levels was to use the RMS, which is root mean squared. Root mean squared is when you take the sum of the square of the measurements and then you average it and then take the square root. So root mean squared, mean being average. And then my threshold is going to be slightly above what I measure the background background to be. So I was just tinkering with this this afternoon and I got it down to about two and a half percent above the ambience. And we'll see why I want to do that in just a moment when we run the program. It just stops num numbers just running up the screen. It gives it just a little bit more control. But we want to find out where it is. So I say machine intelligence, machine learning, it's just mathematics. That's all it is. And that's all we're doing here. It's just a little bit of maths. Easy. Then it's going to start listening. And I'm going to take the RMS of the reference, that, that is anything unfiltered. I'm going to take the RMS of the high pass filter, just listening. And I'm going to do the same for the low pass filter. And we'll have a look at what numbers come out of it. And after that, then we can decide, well, what sort of learning do we want to try and do with this? And then what it will do at the end as well, as we'll see, is I've, I've put some time traps in here. So when, if it goes quiet, say you stopped making sound waves, then the program will pause. But it's got to be quiet. I've made it quiet for one second. So this is what this quiet time. So it reads the Unix time. Unix time is measured. It's a seconds count since uh, the 1st January 1970. So I've taken that as a reference of quiet time. And so if my quiet time is essentially greater than been greater than one second, then it'll assume that it's a bit a bit hush. So depending on what your application is, of course, you might want to have a little bit of a play with this. So fingers crossed, this will work. So when it runs, there we go. So I'm going to press the key and I'm going to go hush whilst it listens to the background noise. And then hopefully it'll then get a threshold level. Now that what looks like an arbitrary number is actually just the ADC number. In the micro um controller the pico it's a 16 bit number so it'll we'll go up to 6 uh 5335 was it 3553 one of the two <clears throat> and so that number is just what it's reading coming in so and i've set the threshold is just very slightly above that and then it'll start listening so if i keep quiet it'll it'll sit there and hopefully do nothing. And if I say something, hopefully then that'll be above the threshold and then we can maybe start to try and detect. So, right. So as I talk, it's just going straight into the, into the Pico and it's doing a little bit of number crunching. Now you can probably guess here already that there is probably no way you would be able to, in, I don't think you could do it in micro Python to be able to do full on frequency analysis. Uh, I haven't tried, if I'm honest, but some of the stuff I was looking at when I was trying to even get some of the really low frequency numbers uh, measurements in is if I could just pick up what I see on the oscilloscope, there really was absolutely no hope. So remember, it's, it's only an M0 plus. It's, it's not a full-on microprocessor. So the fact you can do anything at all, I think, is quite remarkable. 
So LPF is the low pass filter values and HPF is the high pass filter values. And they're, they're slightly different because just because the way the filters are working. And of course, it's also affected by the, uh, the audio amplifier. <laughs> there are, if you look on a mobile phone, for example, there's plenty of apps for looking at audio signals. You know, if you're talking to it, it'll give you a, a frequency analysis because it's a microprocessor. <clears throat> and you, you will see that at the high frequencies and the very low frequencies, it, it's absolute rubbish. And there's this sweet spot in the middle where it's usually pretty good. And we're seeing something fairly similar here. So the high frequencies, it's not really so good at. But if we were to do a low sound like, uh, mm, okay, there's some, or if we go to S, we go S, Yes. You can see just there, right at the end, you see the high frequencies, HPF, suddenly we've got some, it's picked up some high frequency sounds. And uh, in the word no, look, there's a 908. So as you can see, the numbers are a little bit all over the place. So you've got to do a little bit of clever number crunching to try and work out what on earth is going on here. And by way of example, if I just change the program a little bit, uh, there we go. If I change this program, if I take out that one there. So I'm just changing the program around here just to, rather than printing out these numbers scrolling up the screen, I've, I've now just edited it just so if it receives a high pass filter value of above 800. And if you're doing some machine learning, you'd, you'd probably want to try and calibrate it. So I've just seen just by looking at the numbers coming up the screen, yeah, above 800 is roughly a high frequency sound. If it's sort of below that, yeah, it's probably a low frequency sound. So fingers crossed. Oh, hello. What's happened there? This is a, this is the space thing. It's very picky on spaces, isn't it, uh, Python? So a loo sound. Say no, or low frequencies, low. If I say yes, we might see low because yeah is low frequencies, and the end of the word yes is high frequencies. So fingers crossed, we'll let it get ready. If we say the word yes, we might see lots of no followed by some yeses. Yes. That was lucky it worked. <clears throat> I did something similar to this when, oh, years ago. Um, for those who remember the BBC Micro, um, I did something very similar when I was doing my GCSEs. Now, when I was there, sort of 16, my A levels along road, 16 to 18. Um, I did something sim similar to this sort of idea then uh, to, to drive a yes no menu program. But what you could do. Uh, if we run it again, so what we could try and do, <clears throat> if you're doing some machine learning with this, is try and create the profile of a sound of high and low frequencies. Um, so we'll, we'll say the word SO in a moment and then I'll pause it. So SO, the car company, the uh, fuel company, low, low frequencies, then there's high frequencies, and then there's low frequencies. So hopefully we'll see sort of low, high, low. SO. Mm, almost. <laughs> so, there we go. Low, high, low. 
So I think you can see it's not bomb proof. Um, you'd need to do a little bit more coding. I, I did a bit of work with trying to work out, if you remember that early picture of the length of the sound. So could you use, start to use the length of a sound as a scale factor? So if you draw, drew out the word no or yes, you could then scale it to try and get some other parameters for um, what you're trying to see. And so this program's already, you can download this program. Um, I have put it down there for a download. And I think that might bring me to the end of sounds on the Raspberry Pi Pico. So, um, let me open the floor to any any comments, questions, things that we want to see again, bits of program that weren't quite clear. I'll open the floor. Hiya. Hello, Ruth. I made it eventually. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, six five five three five is the number. Six five, yeah, six five five, yeah. Uh, there's a five season fires in there. I think, oh god, I should have written that number down. Yes, but of course, don't forget. Um, if you took three point three and divided by that that amazing number, you'll be thinking you'd be getting sort of you know millivolt resolution in your ADC. But of course, you don't really because obviously those first few bits in in an ADC are usually pretty noisy and meaningless. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, de it depends massively on, on, the, on the hardware. And by that, I don't just mean the digital hardware, I mean the analog hardware. Oh, totally. Um, yeah, I mean, what I've got here is, is a, a lash up, if you like. <laughs> But I'd, I'd say that on that note, uh, when, when I got the invite to um, from Bletchley um, to fix the Atari um, arcade machine a few months ago, um, the way they designed or split the analog from the elect from the digital, uh, and this was 1989 stuff, uh, everything about it was just so well thought out. You know, they had the power supply in the middle, and then they had the analog, and then they had the digital, and that they yeah. didn't try and mix them or anything like that, there's so much thought that had gone into the layout. So yeah, that layout is everything when, when you're talking analog signals. I'm not quite sure why, but it, I, I, any, any sort of circuit that's sort of, shall we say, mostly digital um, these days, the analog side seems to have been designed at a very basic level, you know, with respect to noise and interference and ground loops and all of those fun things. Yeah. Hope you've got me back now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for spotting out my two, my two errors earlier. I, oh. I, I enjoyed that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so so that there, right? That's um, paying attention. Um, yeah, cool. Um, the, the, the th one of the things to remember, um, if you want to try and get your Python code to run a bit faster, is that if you put your code into a library, and then you build that library into MicroPython, the code of the library becomes somewhat compiled. It's not 100% ah. compiled, but it's an awful lot of work has been done on compiling and it's it's returned to what's called bytecode. Yeah, I, I and and that form of a library should be significantly faster. Um, yeah. I, I also think if if you're going to start to do some proper number crunching, you know, or well whether it's uh you know audio or some lower frequencies, mm -hmm. um you might be better biting the bullet and going to C because that's compiled before it even runs. Mm. So uh, I, I did most of my stuff in C uh, when you could buy ST micro, um, mi micro electronic chips. Yeah. Um, but uh, since ST and everyone else decided 
to um, pull the pin on distributors like DigiKey and IRS. I started okay. having I started having a dig around for well, who's got chips? And yeah. if they're going to have chips, they're going to be having some value because because they're going to have a contract to buy Barry loads a week. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and the Raspberry Pi Pico popped up on the radar. So I thought, okay, then I'm going to have to jump that. And I, I'm actually quite impressed. It's an M0 Plus, the ARM core. So it's a dual ARM core M0 Plus. And I'm actually quite impressed with how much punch it can pack for such a small microcontroller. Yeah. From so, what I can tell, it's un for an M0 Plus, it's unusually quick. Yeah, I say. Uh, I mean, I have come across a few gotchas. Uh, we mentioned last week we have, we've had another gotcha during the week, uh, which took a day to sort out. Um, SD cards are in micro Python are an absolute nightmare to work out. Um, it's a usual story which you find that when you come come against problems, there's plenty of people lamenting the issue, mm. and nobody's really got a solution. So I won't get into the solution now, but uh, the solution for the SD card was to was to track down the SD card dot pi library. I then got hold of some sample code, which was clearly extremely buggy. And between the two bits of sample code, I managed to work out <laughs> what exactly the code should be in order to make this thing work. And it 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 oh, took fun. two it took all of an afternoon and also Phil Claridge, if you know Phil Claridge at all, Ruth, or anyone else they you know Phil Claridge. Um yeah, it it it, it took two 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 brains to try and sort of crack the problem. So I have found, and I'm sure that's not the last problem I found with the micro Python on, on this Pico. But as I say, on the whole, um, I've got to say, I am impressed. Um, just a, another thought, if you are tempted to try and push things a bit further, um, the, shall we say, the standard library for doing anything frequency domain um, is called libffTw um, and pretty much any any sort of software these days that goes anywhere near frequency domain you know FFTs etc um, will they will at least have considered that library if, right. they, if not actually using it so I haven't looked but it's possible that there are micropython modules that essentially wrap libffTw yeah but then I was wondering what we're talking about um FFT stands for fast Fourier transform it's it's a way of it's it's a mathematical way um it's quite efficient actually of converting a a time domain signal to get the frequency domain from it mm -hmm. so it's it's been around um is it Oh, who are the two chaps who came up with? It? There's a number of algorithms kicking around. I think I've forgotten the exact. Huli, in Turney or Turkey, something like that. Something like that. 19, yeah, nineteen twenties, nineteen thirties. I mean, astonishingly long ago. Oh yeah, well as I said before, none of this machine learning intelligence stuff. Um, none of it's new. It's all old school maths all of it it's just we're kind of well i'll say i'll say we can now um have got fast enough computers with enough memory to be able to do the crunching fast enough but you know um i think that used to be true but since you now can't buy the microcontrollers that do that <laughs> fast enough um it's well, kind of a degenerative step pickers are in good supply <laughs> Yeah, well, I say, I mean, the 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 Pico is in good volume still, and long may it stay that way. The other chips, they are still what available. They're just no longer available to you and I. You know, the s, you know, the hobbyist, the, the small medium enterprise business. They're just no longer available to those ventures. So um, you, you've got to rethink how you're going to do this. Uh, I was wondering about trying um, uh, FFT um, or even a discrete Fourier transform in in maybe the the Pico. 
I haven't tried it yet. Be able to. It should be fine. Um, people were running FFTs on hardware that was less than a quarter as powerful as, as the Pico. So, uh, right. So, yeah. There we go. Um, you, and you... people have run it on on little 80 mega chips without great difficulty. So, yeah. right. Um, Picos should be able to do it with no issue. Whether they can do it in pure Python, different matter. But uh, yeah, I, I, I suspect all, definitely. I, you mean you might? You, well, is there is there enough memory? <laughs> Oh, absolutely. I mean, it de depends a bit on how uh, how <laughs> how much <laughs> how much memory you know. How, sorry. Let let me do a little tiny bit of background. So, vast Fourier transform FFT is the pure mathematical algorithm uh, for calculating. Unfortunately, it is not in itself computable because it has infinite series in it. Um, the discrete Fourier transform is the practical version of the fast Fourier transform. So they are in, in a kind of sense the same thing. And most people s use the term FFT and DFT, discrete Fourier transform, to mean the same thing. But they're not strictly the same thing. FFT is a pure maths thing that is literally impossible to calculate in actual physical hardware, whereas DFT is very, very possible. Um, so when you calculate, um, and I'm going to carry on doing the, what everyone else does, when you calculate the fast Fourier transform of an input signal, you end up with a number of frequency bins saying there's so much energy in this range of frequencies and there's so much in that range of frequencies and so forth up up through the scale so the number and the difficulty of calculation and the amount of memory needed is very dependent on the number of frequency bins so if you do say i know 16 bins you're going to find it's very quick and very low on memory if you mm. do a thousand bins it's going to be quite a lot slower. <laughs> um, now, there are libraries around where people have gone to extraordinary length to try and improve the speed of these things. So libfft is no doubt one of them, but it's not the only one uh, where people have looked for all of the possible little um, duplications of effort or we don't actually use that value here and so forth and so on through the algorithm rather than just doing a very na naive version which would indeed duplicate a lot of effort uh, and so that's one of the reasons why some libraries are faster than others uh, yeah. but fundamentally it it's the same the same thing on all libraries and you should get the same results. Um, your, your best bet on a Pi is going to be to do it as an integer calculation, which is perfectly possible. Um, however, boring old bog standard libraries will want you to do it as a floating point one. I say use integer on a Pi because mm -hmm. there is no floating point hardware on a Pi. No, uh, and in fact, as we've uh, as I've discovered before, and as I mentioned mm. before, that there, there are rounding errors in the yeah. in the Pico, which so um, the, the particular implementation of the library in the Pico for doing floating point, they've taken some shortcuts. Yeah. Um, so uh, things to be aware of. Indeed. So anyway, that just reinforces the point. Go for an integer solution to FFT if you're going to do it that way. Yeah, there you go, everybody. One of the fun things you can do with FFT, if you want to, is you can convert into the frequency domain. You can then modify your frequency bins, and then you convert back again. So if you were, for example, to 
left shift your frequency bin so that you lose the bottom end one and everything else moves down a bin. The effect of that would be to lower the frequencies of the resulting sound without changing the speed at which those sounds are happening. So this is how you end up with, um, uh, uh, you, you, you might have, have seen it or whatever on YouTube and Audible and, and lots of other places. You can these days speed up and slow down the, the speed of the video. And what they're doing is exactly that. They're doing the FFT, modifying the bins and then reconverting to audio. Um, and by doing that, you can then counter the natural raise or lower of the pitch that you would otherwise get by speeding up or slowing down the actual stream. I don't know if that's come through properly, but it's, it's quite fun. Um, you could also do weird and wonderful filtering things by just sort of applying a curve to the frequency, mm -hmm. multiply everything by a half or yeah etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. weirdness and wonderfulness um i hope that was of some interest to people that's absolutely yes i'm, I'm just checking through <laughs> my my notebook here on that the filter pages i made a bit of a mess off earlier right <laughs> okay what I, what I will say i'll just i will correct the um powerpoint slide before i re-upload it but i will just say in, in my defense uh what i overlooked when um it was kindly pointed out i appear to have um the the same page for high pass and low pass from the data sheets um in order to get the low for the to go from a low pass filter to a high pass filter you would actually just swap the inductors and the capacitors around <laughs> and uh, I just looked through the note, but the book here, the uh, the fantastic book, I do advocate, and it doesn't really mention that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'll I'll make a note on these slides before I, I republish them. If anyone wants to download them, um, you can always call me, uh, drop me emails. Uh, I'm always taking messages. So what I will do, everybody uh 22 this is now the after party of course <laughs> is so uh our next outing if you like is the 4th of january and uh it's going to be on proximity so um i'm quite decided what i'm going to do for that probably will do some infrared and i've got some wind turbine stuff going on here and we're using an infrared proximity detector to measure the rotational speed, uh, we have noticed a few things that uh, make it less than ideal. So we'll we'll have a, I, I need to come up with a solution for that problem this week. So that's going to be me tomorrow scratching my head with this infrared sensor. <laughs> so uh, I will get to share that all with you um, next time. Right, okay. Uh, anyone else for anything else?